Hello and welcome to another video that starts with someone saying hello and welcome. I am the Grigster and I'm going to be previewing the under 21 uh, World Cup 2020 semi-finals. So the first game we're going to have Argentina against Uruguay. We're just going to quickly... Oh man, I have way too many tabs. Uh, which... We're just going to quickly look through each of the team's runs, break down what we expect them to play, all that kind of thing. So Argentina in their first game played a 5-2 double winger, uh, three. <clears throat> I, For reasons that I'll get into, I don't expect them to play a formation like this in their game against Peru. You can see that this was a very defensive game which actually resulted in quite a few goals being scored. Uh, both teams playing five at the back, being the primary, I mean, five and two, five and two. Um, so both teams didn't have a lot of, I guess, attacking to do. If we look at the statistics, we can see a tackle rate, 56 is pretty good. Uruguay only 44. Uh, we can also see that Argentina completed 75% of their passes. They actually had more shots on goal, but less of them were on target. So we could definitely say Argentina deserve more than a loss from this game, but that's the result. That's manager's own sometimes. Uh, moving on to Argentina and China. So this game is interesting because it's one of the few games where China's gone for a strategy. Uh, China's designed this formation specifically to go against Argentina. Argentina correctly uh, predicts that China's going to go wing play, which is the main reason you would go five at the back. They did not predict correctly against Uruguay. So they're actually playing the same formation here. And they just get a 1-1 draw out of the game. And you can see that China gets more shots on target. If we look at the statistics, they've got 9 shots on goal to 15. And even though they complete more passes, um, China's tackle rate in this game, 56%. Pretty much negating any benefit from Argentina's high passing percent. So, once again, a 5 at the back strategy and Argentina getting a less than ideal result. Their final group game, so at this point they had one point from two games, uh, but if they, with the way everything fell, if they beat Hungary, they would qualify guaranteed for the next round, and they did so. Once again, going 5 at the back, Hungary, one of the weaker teams... Well, the weakest team in their group, as it turns out. Hungary going ultra defensive, 4-3, and then short passing up the middle. Argentina still playing the 5 at the back, and then going short passing. So we can see Hungary actually had 73% of their passes, which is very high. Not as high as 78, though, with Argentina. Um... So Argentina in this game, I would say, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of shots. So the offense worked well. I would assume that because Hungary is playing quite a high defensive line here, it's on the dark color, sort of in the middle. It's a little bit higher than Argentina has been playing. The dark color would correspond to this light color. I'm pretty sure it's one away. Dark color is one away. Yep. So this light color. So Uruguay played a similarly high line. Uh, Argentina, I mean China played quite far back. So higher lines, you're going to give away more sort of one-on-ones with the keeper. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, because in the sim, one-on-ones don't really have a very... They don't have a super high chance of going in compared to like if the defender's being pressured or whatever 
So, Hungry, and this is um, an interesting game because it's kind of what I, how I expect Peru to play a little bit, but they'll have this 4 free setup, but they're going to play quite deep. Uh, usually you play a higher line, you try to win the ball back earlier, which will create scoring opportunities, uh, which might be a reason why we've got so many shots going on in this game, with both teams playing a reasonably high line which means the defender intercepts the ball and they can pass basically straight to the attacker, whereas if you play deeper, the defender typically has to clear it to an attacking midfield player. In this game, you're, Hungary's only got one attacking midfield player. But by playing the higher line, the two strikers will come into the passing options for the defenders. Now, this is the round of 16 game. Argentina only winning 1-0. We've got short passing up the middle versus Ecuador, which I believe, yeah, which was short passing uh, offset. I didn't really like this formation, but it's what they played. Uh, playing three at the back, though, would have, I mean, ideally you play three and two, but three and three is much, much better actually against wings than three and two. So, if you're going to play three, uh, if you go three and three, it's the less risky of your options there. And if we look at these statistics, we can see Argentina 76% passing from 112 attempts. Argentina really dominated this game, 45 intercepts to just 26. You can see the Ecuadorian keeper had 18 pass attempts. That's an indication of how often the keeper had to become. I mean, the keeper's made 14 saves, and most of the amount of intercepts is 8. So the keeper's actually the person who's stopping the ball the most in this lineup for Ecuador. Um, but you can see just pretty pretty much a domination um ecuador's if, if ecuador's attack was better i would have given them more chance in this game but it is what it is and finally we have argentina and usa so argentina in this game going to a four two one and then out wing play three and this is actually what i what i would play if i was in argentina's position going into a game against Peru. Uh, the US opposed them with five at the back, five two, one in the middle, uh, two, one support striker and one dedicated poaching striker. Go back to Argentina. So this 4-2 setup is very, I would say, generic. It's going to perform about equally well against wing play and short passing. Uh, this is what I would recommend generally if you're going into a game as the favorite and Argentina should consider themselves the heavy favorite against Peru. Uh, the other thing is worth talking about here is that in Argentina's games, they have struggled to score with the exception of Hungary. Um, I haven't actually looked at two goals after the substitutes. Uh, which is an important note because goals after subs. So Rufo was a sub and Elizardo played the whole game. Um, Elizardo is the attacking midfielder in this lineup. Interesting. He's playing as a striker here, is Elizardo. Elizardo. Um, so this, this one extra player is going to help them generate scores, scoring opportunities. Um, personally, I would be playing them more in an attacking midfield type role. So you've got the a triangle in attack plus the winger. Uh, but basically, I would not be playing five at the back against Peru simply because... I feel like that's playing into their hands a bit, and we'll talk about that in when I get to Peru. Uh, so I think this is what they're going to play, or something similar to what they're going to play. So we're just going to look at their goals. Get the names up. Okay. 
So here we have the pass to the winger, Jericho. Jericho going down the left wing, crossing in. Uh, Rufo was there. Rufo was their number one goal scorer in qualifiers. He gets a header from the penalty spot. It does not matter that the player is being marked. Uh, this next one is going to be them conceding a goal. So this is the USA. You can see the two central defenders being sucked up the field trying to mark players, which results in Finn getting free in the box and scoring. You can see the two wing defenders basically playing everyone on side. That is the risk of playing a flat four at the back. I mean, it's a risk for any uh, formation and that you play, but it's particularly bad for four at the back. Anyway, here we have the intercept by the central defender. Ball goes to the wing. Ball gets played into the middle. Kianaro, Pinola. Pinola, so this is the wing back getting forward because they're playing wings and crossing it to Elizardo. And Elizardo scoring despite heavy pressure. But once again, he's shooting from around, like slightly back of the penalty spot. And we're going to get into why that is important again when we get to Peru. So this goal we've got... Actually, let's go back a little bit further and get the play to develop. So we've got the wing back passing to the winger. The winger gets past the first defender and also... Oh no, not the second defender, crosses beforehand. No, that's not part of the goal. Lol. Um, one thing about the five at the back this is the goal this is the goal so this is basically just an intercept and a pass straight to a striker who's through on goal uh, like i was talking about before if you play a high line you're more likely to generate those types of opportunities but your risk is you're letting people through on goal uh, what I was going to mention was the USA, the initial formation was to try and generate, uh, use their wingbacks to get up the pitch and cross the ball in. Uh, so the winger before we saw for Argentina getting free, and part of that is because the wingback gets up the field, can't run all the way back. And this is Velasco. We've got Cordero on the wing now. Uh, so the U.S. winning the ball back here. They're trying to attack down the opposite wing, which is generally not a good strategy if you're the underdog. Here's Cordero. Crosses in, sharp scores, pretty basic wing play. But again, the goal is being scored from behind the penalty spot. And when we get into the Peruvian game, I'll get into why that's an important note. But also, the other thing is, with wing play, you're generally scoring from, like, your, where you're taking your shots from is less dependent on where the defenders are. So, if you're playing short passing, this game ends 4-1, by the way, we can see that at the bottom. If you're playing short passing, uh, where the defenders are will affect where you get your shots from, but if you're playing wing play, uh, this effect will be less so because the strikers are shooting directly from where they stand, so to speak. Whereas in short passing, the strikers will have to dribble around defenders or away from defenders. Uh, this is an opportunity, this is an example of a one-on-one, -on -one and I mean, the player misses from like the six-yard box, right? Uh, but there's an example of like a one-on-one, -on -one why giving away one-on-ones is not that bad. Anyway, that will cover Argentina. So, the other side of the Peru-Argentina game is obviously Peru. Uh, if I can find the tab that I... So, Peru in the tournament, they have won every single game. Very impressive victories against Spain, Portugal. Uh, they upset Mexico and Poland. Uh, you can look at what Peru's playing. So, a deep back five against Poland. Oh, not that one. Against Switzerland, again, a deep back 4-3 formation. 
Oh, I've only got those two up. Okay, that's fine. Um, so Peru is generally playing like a deeper, and then they're guessing they're either going five at the back if they think they're going to be up against wings. Obviously in this game, Poland switched to a short passing tactic. Didn't work for them. Uh, in this game, Switzerland went short passing mostly. And again, Peru uh, won. Switzerland actually scored the most goals against Peru, which is why I've got that game up. But perhaps the best way to explain you know, what they are doing is by looking at this. So we have all, so we have the shots taken by Switzerland, by Poland, and by Mexico on the left. Uh, v shots. Uh, so in three games, three out of the five games, uh, so Peru's opponents from those games are on the left, and you can see the shots that Peru is getting on the right. And so Peru won all three of these games. You probably would not be able to tell from this um, the way the fact that there's so many more shots on the left side. Um, like just like last video, so we've got blue is there's no one near you and you're taking a shot and it's on target. Yellow is there's a defender nearby. The black dots are goals. You can see there's been three goals in three games in these three games compared to Peru's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, these light blue dots are misses. The sort of peach colour is a miss with a defender nearby, and a brown is a free kick. That's the only free kick shot that there was in these games. So what we can see is Peru's defence, so they're sitting, they sit their defence a little bit back. So what is happening in these games is they're conceding essentially control of the game to their opponent. But because the defenders are sitting further back, the opponent is not getting shots sort of on this line here. They're taking all of their shots basically between the penalty spot and the six yard box. And as you can see, the vast majority of these shots are being saved. Uh, whereas you compare that with Peru, uh, all of their shots are actually coming with a nearby defender. So maybe we might have to... I don't know if that's a trend, I haven't, like, you know, I haven't looked into it super, 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 super much. Um, but you can see that all of Peru's, the vast majority, are with a defender nearby. Uh, the other thing to note is their goals are generally scored, they've got one from behind the penalty spot. Uh, they've got one from the penalty spot, but then most of their goals are being scored sort of on an angle around the six yard box whereas their the shots that they're giving up they've got two on the angle from just where the six yard box is but the vast majority are sort of in this little tiny box where basically theoretically the striker has like everything to aim for uh, but for whatever reason in the sim at the moment these shots are mostly being saved so Peru's sort of design, then part of this will be they typically play a back four or back five, but not a back three. So against a back three, I would expect more like um, these, more like what Peru's shot chart looks like, like a wider variety of angles. Against a back four, you're basically going up the middle every time, typically. Uh, the other thing to note is their opponents are usually if i go i need to do my tab thing okay uh we can see here so switzerland had the most success and they played uh two wider strikers we look at a team like poland and poland's playing very much trying to play down straight down the middle and mexico did the same thing trying to play straight down the middle so i i think so one of the things, and you'll also notice that neither of these teams is playing wing tactics. So based on this, I would say as Argentina, that's why I was recommending they play a four at the back wing strategy, just like they played against the USA. 
Uh, if they go short passing, they should be looking at the sort of Switzerland model with a little bit wider strikers, because that seems to be what was has been working against the Peruvian defense, which I think has only conceded four goals in the tournament so far. They've actually got the best defense. Three goals. They've only conceded three goals in five games, Peru. So I would be looking very much at this Switzerland game, where Switzerland managed to score twice. I would be expecting Peru... I think it's 50-50 whether Peru is going to play short passing or wings. I think they will go to wings at some point. I still think 4-2... The thing about playing a 4-2 as opposed to 5, say 5-2, which is what Argentina has typically played in these games. I think that you want the extra attacker because you, you need to make sure you can score. For Argentina to win the game, I think they need to score at least two goals. You can see Peru's pretty consistently scored two goals, at least two goals in every game. As Argentina, I think the attitude that you take into this game is we need to score at least two goals. Therefore, we will sacrifice, potentially sacrifice a little bit of defense. I think Peru is going to give you control of the game regardless. So having an extra striker uh, will result in... It'll guard a little bit against being simmed because if you've only got one striker and the striker has a RNG bad game, then you're liable for like this kind of result with Poland. Um, if we look at the stats for Poland... Like, the main guy's taken seven shots. Oh, the second guy's taken five. So that's sort of like two people having a bad game in front of goal. But the more people, the more evenly you can spread out the shots, I think the more likely you're going to score, like, two goals. Uh, compared to if you just have, say, one striker, like I was saying, you can be a little bit reliant on that striker having a good game and not a bad game. Anyway, that will cover Argentina-Peru. I expect Argentina to win. I think Argentina will... I think it will... Let's say 2-1 to Argentina. I think Peru will score regardless, but I think Argentina should be looking to attack and should be looking to score at least two goals. And if they score two goals, I think they win the game.